Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to the winter 2022 season of the Virtual Museum Lecture Series presented by the St. Catharines Museum and Welland Canal Center. Of course, maybe I should say spring or even summer with today's beautiful weather. Our community is filled with diverse stories, and we recognize that our story begins with the indigenous peoples of this land. We uh, acknowledge that we are broadcasting this lecture on lands that have been inhabited by indigenous peoples for millennia. And we would like to honor the centuries of indigenous peoples who walked on Turtle Island before us. Good evening, everyone. My name is Adrian Petrie, Visitor Services Coordinator here at the St. Catharines Museum and Wallen Canal Center. Welcome back to the series and a special welcome to any audience members out there who are new to the series. Thank you very much for joining us. We hope these lectures provide a bit of historical joy and spark imagination and exploration into our city's rich history. There are so many ways to join in, and join in on the historical fun and get your local history fix. You can, uh, you can view all the past lectures on YouTube, on our YouTube channel playlist. And you can also listen to the lecture audio on our podcast, VMLS via podcast, which you can find anywhere you get your podcasts under STC Museum Podcasts. Not including tonight, we only have just one remaining lecture for the spring or winter, whatever you wanna call it, this series of the lecture series. Uh, details of the lineup were of course included in the uh, VMLS email today and are also on our website, stcatharinesmuseum.ca. But we are want to note that we are thrilled to welcome uh, special guest, Natasha Henry, back to the lecture series uh, in two weeks time on May 24th. Don't miss it. We are also very excited to announce the lineup for the autumn series of the lecture series, but you'll have to wait just a few more weeks to hear about the topics and the lecturers. For now, please mark your calendars for Tuesdays in the fall, September 20th, October 4th, 18th, uh, November 1st, 15th and 29th, and December 13th. I'm really excited about the fall too. I know I'm always excited about all the lectures, um, but it's gonna be a great lecture series in the fall. As always, please feel free to make use of the chat box uh, just to the right-hand side of your screen if you're on a computer, it might be below your screen if you're on a mobile device. Uh, we'll moderate, of course, during the, chat, uh, during the presentation, but we'll take up your questions in discussion format at the end of the presentation. So if we miss your question in the middle of the podcast, not to worry, we'll get to it at the end of the presentation. We always so appreciate you joining the lecture series and we would equally appreciate a donation in support of our programming. Your donations help us to continue to provide the high quality and enjoyable programming that you've come to expect from us. We really appreciate any donation that you're able to make. Give us a call at 905-984-8880 or visit the donation portal on our active STC page to make a donation. The link for the portal was included in the VMLS email today. Your donation makes a difference. Thank you. And now I'm happy to welcome our curator and the supervisor of historical services here at the city back to the series with a lecture titled Election, uh, a lecture titled Election 1917, Wartime Canada Goes to the Polls. I put in an exclamation point. There isn't one, but maybe there should be. Uh, take it away, Kathy. Awesome. Thanks so much, Adrian. Here, let me just uh, bring up my uh, my lecture. Okay. There we go. Okay, good evening, uh, everyone, and uh, thanks so much for joining me for this lecture on the 1917 Canadian federal election, uh, also known as the Khaki election, uh, and St. Catherine's experience of that election campaign. I want to acknowledge as a start the sources I used for this lecture. Firstly, I have to big, give a very big shout out and thanks to historians Patrice Dutille and David McKenzie, whose book, Embattled Nation, which you can see here on this slide, uh, Canada's wartime election of 1917, 
is actually the preeminent source for the 1917 political context and uh, countrywide perspective on the election itself. Uh, for the local perspective, the not surprisingly, the largest source that informed the content of this lecture was the St. Catherine Standard on uh, microfilm. Uh, for information on J.D. Chaplin, as you'll hear about later, I also want to uh, thank Janet Partridge and Gord Chaplin, who provided some family reminiscences to help fill in some of the blanks. Uh, additionally, a collected series of letters uh, that were compiled in 1938 under the supervision of Sir Charles G.D. Roberts for Trans Canada Press were very useful in helping to provide a contemporary look at J.D. Chaplin uh, at the time of his death. We'll hear who J.D. Chaplin is in a, a short while, <laughs> for those of you who don't know. So let's uh, get started and let's set the stage for what was going on in Canada in 1917, uh, which would lead to one of Canada's most controversial federal elections. Uh, and to do that, I'm going to quote uh, Dutil and Mackenzie in their book. And I quote, the 1917 election was fought at a time that is almost impossible to imagine today. The Bolshevik Revolution was unfolding in Russia, and it seemed as if the days of European royalty were coming to an end. Canada had already lost at least 40,000 soldiers by December of that year, and the epic Battle of Passchendaele, which brought tragedy to thousands of Canadian families, had been fought only weeks before the election. During the campaign itself, Halifax was almost completely destroyed by the explosion that, that was triggered by the collision of two ships in the harbor. Canada, more than any other time in its history, was an embattled nation, divided almost as much as the Europe it hoped to assist. The country was challenged physically, morally, and intellectually as never before, and it was in this context that Canadian voters were obliged to perform their democratic duty. While Canadian troops bravely marched in Europe, Canadian voters marched to the polls with a conviction that in this brave new world, their votes would make a difference and set the country on a better path to the future." End quote. The Canadian government under Robert Borden throughout the first three years of the war had already been forced to make very tough decisions in order to get the country successfully to the end. While Borden had maintained a position since the start of the war in 1914 that Canadian troops would not be conscripted into service, or that Canadian men would not be conscripted into service, by the end of 1916, it was clear that voluntary enlistment was drying up and that more men would be needed if the war was to be won. To that end, in January 1916, the government established a National Service Board to take stock of the manpower that was available in the country. Borden recognized the need to get support from this initiative in Quebec as a province with a large population of men of fighting age, as well as a large percentage of the federal vote. At the time, Borden also made overtures to Sir Wilfrid Laurier, who was the liberal leader at the time uh, and leader of opposition, but he declined to support this registry. At the time that Borden brought in the National Service Board, he didn't expect to bring in conscription. Uh, the National Registry was not really a threat for compulsory service, uh, but for many of those who were outside of government, no matter what Borden said, they thought that this was just uh, the kind of the thin edge of the wedge and that it was just the precursor and uh, that eventually they might get to, uh, to the idea of conscription being more popular. But still, in early 1916, uh, or sorry, yeah, early 1916 um, in January, conscription was still not on the radar. In March 1917, let's skip forward about a year or so, Borden actually traveled to England to attend the Imperial War Conference. During his three months overseas, he would also spend time visiting Canadian soldiers fighting at the front and getting more information about the state of the war and Canada's soldiers. This photo is actually a photo from that uh, visit to, uh, to Europe during the Imperial War Conference. During that time also, Borden's most important contrib contribution to the Imperial War Conference was Re Resolution 9, 
which recognized Canada and other dominions as autonomous nations and fully equal within the Commonwealth, and that they should have continuous consultation and an adequate voice in foreign policy. While at the Imperial War Conference and in meetings with Canadian officials in the War Office, Borden gathered information regarding the current status of the war and Canada's troops, which led him to believe that more Canadians would be needed to hold the line in Europe until the American forces who had just joined the war uh, would join the fight overseas. He was beginning to see the need for conscription since voluntary enlistment was just not keeping up with the need for men to fill the ranks. While he had been hearing from English Canadians who supported conscription much earlier in the war prior to his visit to Europe, he had so far not supported the idea of compulsory service as I mentioned earlier. But the Battle of Vimy Ridge and his meeting with sick and wounded soldiers brought matters into sharp focus for him. On the one hand, the victory at Vimy Ridge gave a great boost to Canadian pride and prestige and the sacrifice of these thousands of Canadian soldiers only made Borden more determined not to let them down. On the other hand, the cost in lives was unbearable and when compared to recent recruitment numbers, unsustainable. Casualty rates were far higher than new enlistments. When he arrived back in Canada, Borden informed his cabinet and the governor general that it was time to introduce compulsory military service. Borden said this on May 18, 1917, when he presented his intentions to in introduce conscription. And I quote, the Canadian Corps cannot be maintained without thorough provision for future requirements. Hitherto, we have depended on voluntary enlistment, but it is apparent to me that the voluntary system will not yield further substantial results. All citizens are liable to military service for defense of their country. Therefore, it is my duty to announce to the House that early proposals will be made to provide by compulsory military enlistment on a selective basis, such reinforcements as may be necessary to maintain the Canadian Army in the field. He went on to say that the number of men that may be needed will not be less than 50,000 and will probably be 100,000. Because the issue was so contentious, Borden felt it necessary to get Wilfrid Laurier's liberal government on his side and proposed forming a coalition government that would be made up of members of both parties and would remain in power for the remainder of the war. Borden understood that conscription would need the full support across the country, including in Quebec, to keep the country from fracturing over the issue. This issue polarized the country. Ernest Lapointe, a Liberal Member of Parliament for Kamouraska, called the conscription legislation brought forward by the Borden government the most important legislation since Confederation, and noted that it would be unacceptable to Quebec since it was in a direct violation of all the pledges given by this government, this parliament, and all the public men of this country to the Canadian people. During the summer months of 1917, the St. Catherine Standard ran numerous stories related to conscription. This article is one such example, which ran in the Standard on August 22nd, 1917, and was a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek editorial about the death of voluntary service. And to quote the editorial, the recruiting officers stationed in the recruiting car in front of the YMCA have given up all hope of securing many additional voluntary recruits. As a memorial to the old system, they painted their large signboard in front of the car black and on it tacked four pieces of paper, the contents of which attracted considerable attention throughout the day. Monday was the day of mourning, and today the intention was to change the color scheme and advise the young men that they should ride to Berlin with the Canadian mounted rifles, end quote. Of course, this is much a larger editorial. I only quoted a small piece of it. 
The conscription bill, officially known as the Military Service Act, was drafted by the Minister of Justice at the time, Arthur Meehan, and passed a second reading with a vote of 119 to 55, with 26 of Laurier's Liberals voting for the legislation. Laurier's support in English Canada was severely impacted as a result of the Liberal stance against the bill. The Military Service Act was signed into law in August 1917. Laurier, who knew he would lose his base of support in Quebec if he were to support conscription, was not in favor of a coalition government and rejected the idea. Sir Wilfrid felt that an issue of such import as compulsory service should be taken to the electorate in a plebiscite rather than just rammed through the legislative process. When it became clear that the Liberals were not in favor of a national coalition government and that the country would need to go to the polls in 1917, and because conscription and a conservative government in power were an important part of Borden's plan to win the war, two other pieces of legislation were introduced in order to see, in order for Borden to see that happen. These were the Military Voters Act and the Wartime Elections Act. I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these, not very much, but if you're interested to hear more about all of this legislation that happened uh, during the First World War, I would encourage you to go and uh, listen to my lecture uh, called When the World Changed, uh, or to watch my lecture or listen to it, uh, which you can find on our YouTube channel. Oops. So the standard noted about the Military Voters Bill, also known as the Franchise Act, on August 20, 1917, that this piece of legislation was written essentially to manipulate the vote to the point where the Liberals would have no chance of being elected in the upcoming election. The article states, everyone who has ever gone over election results returns Sorry, everyone who has ever gone over election returns is familiar with the fact that a few thousand votes nicely distributed among the various close ridings would entirely change the general results. It therefore would be quite possible to so mobilize and distribute the overseas vote so as to make every doubtful riding safe for the government. And it is to be presumed that the great bulk of the soldiers overseas will be anxious to do all they can to uphold the government's policy of compulsory military service, end quote. So even in the standard, they're recognizing that the vote has been manipulated here in order to ensure that the vote would go the way they wanted. To illustrate Borden's thinking, at the time, he wrote in his diary on September 25th, 1917, our first duty is to win at any cost, the coming elections in order that we may continue to do our part in winning this war and that Canada not be disgraced. These two piece, with these two pieces of legislation, Borden and his government would engineer the most gerrymandered election in Canadian history. The election would take place on December 17, 1917. And according to historian Patrice Dutille, writing in the Toronto Star in 2017, 100 years after the election, normally it's the people who choose the government. In 1917, it was the government who chose the people. So firstly was the Military Voters Bill. This bill allowed all men in uniform and those who had finished their service honorably to vote. Men under 21 and Indigenous people serving in the Canadian Expeditionary Force were also eligible to vote for the first time. This is essentially 18 and older. Women in uniform and nursing sisters would also be given the vote, a first for Canadian women in a federal election. And in fact, uh, the nursing sisters were the very first women ever to vote in a federal election, uh, just based on the time difference of when they were voting. This bill also extended the franchise to all British born soldiers serving in the Canadian Expeditionary Force 
regardless of their length of time in Canada, as well as any British subject ordinarily resident in Canada who was on active duty in Europe in the Canadian, the British, or any other army allowed army. This meant that several thousand men who were who were neither under the or who were either under the age of 21 or were British born recruits who had come to Canada from the United States to enlist and therefore never actually lived in Canada were also granted the vote. The legislation also allowed soldiers to vote for either the government party, which were the unionists at the time, or the opposition liberals. Additionally, soldiers would be allowed to cast their vote for their last constituency of residence if known. If it wasn't known, their vote would be assigned by the government appointed electoral officer. Prior to the 1917 election, the electoral officer was actually a provincial appointment, uh, but part of the legislation also made the electoral officers um, a federal appointment. Uh, and it was a political appointment. So it was really just a very thinly veiled voter manipulation. The bill contained a clause uh, directing also that overseas votes would not be counted for 31 days after the election. And so this allowed the votes to be applied where they could uh, best determine the outcome of close contests. Under closure, using closure in the parliamentary debate, the conservative majority passed the bill on the 29th of August, 1917. The second piece of legislation that impacted the 1917 election was the wartime elections bill. This legislation was also introduced by Arthur Meehan on September 6, 1917, and allowed for widows, mothers, wives, sisters, and daughters of soldiers the vote. The essence of this bill and the, uh, the, the previous one that I mentioned earlier rested on the premise that since Canadians were forced to fight a wartime election on war-related issues, it was fair to restrict the vote to a wartime electorate. Those without a stake in the war would be deprived of the vote, essentially. At the same time as women were given the vote, women attached to soldiers, normalized immigrants from enemy countries who had come to Canada after 1902 lost their right to vote. Conscientious objectors also lost their right to vote. The fact that they tended to vote liberal was an important consideration in this decision, not to mention that they could not be counted on to support the war effort to the fullest extent. This legislation also directed the federal government to appoint enumerators to compile the electoral rolls, which I mentioned earlier. This had previously been a provincial responsibility, but was taken over by the federal government. In other words, the conservatives as the party in power. The Borden conservative government were forced to introduce closure on this bill three times in order to force it through the House of Commons uh, on September 20th, 1917. It's estimated that this gerrymandering of the vote gave the vote to around 450,000 women while removing the vote from a, somewhere between 50 and 70,000 foreign born Canadians. So the last piece of the puzzle for Borden to successfully contest uh, this election was the establishment of a union government that included both conservatives and the Liberal Party members who supported conscription. And this would be in a win the, win the war party, so to speak. With this coalition in place, the main election issues, successfully fighting the war and conscription would be addressed. Borden had previously been pressing Laurier to support this idea, but when Laurier chose not to do so, Borden and his supporters went ahead anyway and convinced several liberals to join the pro-conscription Unionist Party in order to get to winning the war. According to Dutille and McKenzie, 
The formation of the union government was a personal victory for Borden. He faced down resistance in his own party and ensured that his colleagues came along. He had secured his own leadership in the process and he had demonstrated qualities of decisiveness, persistence, intelligence, and a shrewd understanding of human nature. His own position was untouchable. Even in the new cabinet, despite his offer of equal representation, he and former colleagues dominated. Borden remained as prime minister and conservatives outnumbered the liberals 13 to 10. So now that we've had a look at kind of the macro overview of the and federal perspective, let's take a look at how this all played out in St. Catharines. There are actually two men that we need to hear a little bit about, a little more about who are at the center of the Lincoln election race. Uh, and uh, just for uh, information's sake, you can see on this map uh, what Lincoln County included, which is basically what we're talking here. It's the top part of this map. Uh, it's quite a large uh, um, geographical area at the time. This map is from 1907, but uh, essentially the geographical area here was roughly the same in 1917. But the two men that we want to hear about are Edwin James Lovelace and James Du Chaplin. The Liberal candidate for the County of Lincoln was E.J. Lovelace. This is him here in 1938, much a little, uh, quite a bit later than the election. Um, sadly, there were not a lot of pictures of either of these two men that uh, were around for us to be able to use for this presentation. E.J. Lovelace was born on November 9th, 1866 in Essex County. And so in 1971, in 1917, at the time of the election, he was 51 years old. Uh, what we know about Lovelace is that he attended public schools in his youth and eventually, eventually went into the printer's trade. He worked in a newspaper office uh, in his uh, older life and, uh, or in his working life in the village of Comber and then in Petrolia and then later in St. Catharines. Uh, he was a publisher and editor at the St. Catharines Evening Journal and worked with a gent named J.M. Elson, who you can see is noted as the publisher here. This is an advertisement found in the 1917 um, Vernon's directory. Uh, and uh, J.M. Elson was also the liberal campaign manager in 1917. Uh, and so uh, you can... Uh, you could get kind of get a feel now for how these people are all connected together. Uh, um, where are we here? Sorry, I lost my place. E.J. Lovelace was also um, had put his name forward as a candidate for the Liberal Party in 1904 uh, and uh, in the 1904 election for the House of Commons. Uh, but in 1905, he was appointed postmaster in St. Catharines and he held that post from 1905 to 1911. He was also a commissioned officer in the militia since 1906. A captain and later Major Lovelace served overseas during the First World War with the Royal Field Artillery. He was twice mentioned in dispatches and was awarded the Military Cross for Gallantry in 1918. During the entirety of the 1917 election campaign, Major Lovelace, well, he's captain at the time, was in Europe serving with the Canadian Expeditionary Force. Our unionist candidate for the 1917 election for Lincoln was J.D. Chaplin. Here he is here. This picture is actually from 1917, uh, from the time of his election, of the election. Uh, James Dew Chaplin was born in Toronto, Canada West on March 20th, 1863. So he was 54 at the time of the election in 1917. I suppose their ages don't really matter very much, but although I do find it an interesting fact. Uh, he attended public schools in his youth and went to high school at the St. Catharines Collegiate Institute. He was tall and athletic and was a very proficient lacrosse player. 
Uh, Chaplin was a manufacturer in St. Catharines, and over the course of his business career, he was involved in quite a few manufacturing concerns, including the president of the Chaplin Wheel Company, Canada Axe and Harvest Tool Company, president of the Welland Vale Manufacturing Company, president of the Wallingford Manufacturing Company Limited, uh, president of the Chaplin Realty Company, director of JM Consolidated Gold Mines Limited, director of Hayes Wheel and Forgings Limited of Meriton and Chatham, who manufactured automobile parts and was director of Canadian General Rubber Company of Galt. He had his fingers in a lot of pies. He was also uh, very well connected in St. Catharines and uh, uh, pretty well backed up financially. Uh, J.D. Chaplin also served four years on St. Catharines City Council, and that included as a chairman of the Finance Committee while he was on council. He was nominated as the conservative candidate in the riding of Lincoln in 1915 and, and was in that position in 1917 when the election was called. His first election as a candidate was in 1917, and he ran under Borden's unionist banner, and in later elections returned as the conservative member of parliament for Lincoln County until 1935. The fight for the seat in the riding of Lincoln was complicated from the start by the fact that Lovelace was the liberal candidate. As a serving soldier, he was also in support of conscription and his absence from the local scene had complicated his nomination. It's likely that had he been present, he would have actually stood as a liberal unionist candidate rather than as a, a traditional liberal candidate. There's debate on whether Lovelace should have been given the unionist nomination instead of J.D. Chaplin. Liberal party sentiment on this matter was expressed by D.C. Hetherington in a letter to the editor of The Standard on December 3rd, 1917. Here's the letter to the editor here on the slide. And it says, Dear Sir, I have been much interested in reading your editorials on the political situation in this writing. I believe that the unionist candidate should be Captain E.J. Lovelace. Unfortunately, through no fault of Captain Lovelace, his is not the endorsed candidate, and we have the disgrace of forcing a brave soldier who for the past two years has daily risked his life for us to enter into a contest with another gentleman when both are as one in, an op in opinion. Has it never occurred to you to suggest that it would be a graceful act and a compliment to all soldiers of our overseas army for Mr. Chaplin to withdraw and ask his supporters to vote for Captain Lovelace. I should not think of suggesting this had it been through any bungling or mistakes of Captain Lovelace that the present unfortunate state of affairs arose. Neither would I make the suggestion had not Mr. Chaplin stated that he was willing to give way if Captain Lovelace should announce himself as a supporter of the Unionist government. Captain Lovelace has given much for his country. Leaving out of consideration the daily hardships and dangers he himself has undergone his only son is today a semi-invalid, never likely to recover normal health, the result of wounds and gas poisoning at the front. This alone would entitle him to the generous consideration of every citizen. That there has been a delay in securing a statement from Captain Lovelace as to his position cannot be denied, but the exigencies of a soldier's life frequently prevent his whereabouts being known at any particular time. If party politics and church affiliations are to be eliminated from this election, I know of no argument which could be used in favor of Mr. Chaplin's election, which could be used with equal force for the election of Captain Lovelace. I cast no reflections on Mr. Chaplin, his services to the country as a manufacturer of munitions, great as they have been, are not to be compared with those of any soldier whose life itself is daily hazarded for his country's defense. Strong words from Mr. Hetherington. 
sorry, this is very small for you to be able to read it, but I'm going to quote, so don't worry, you don't need to be able to see it. But the editor of the paper does respond to this in a long editorial. The reason why I put this whole editorial up on the slide was so that you could see how long it was. It basically took up three pages or three columns in the newspaper, which is a lot of space. Um, and he, rep the editor responded in the same paper. He didn't even wait for people to read the first one. Basically, he responded to the editorial and then you had to flip through the paper and find the original letter to the editor. Uh, for a second I, here, I'm going to take a moment to, uh, uh, to just digress a bit and comment on the source material that I was using here, as, which was the St. Catherine Standard, as I mentioned earlier. The St. Catherine Standard was very clearly in support of the unionist candidate in this race. Uh, there's actually a bit of a shadow contest happening that you don't see uh, in the paper so much. Um, it's happening at the same time as the real election between the St. Catherine Standard and the St. Catherine's Evening Journal. So W.B. Burgoyne, who was the editor of the Standard, was also acting as the campaign manager for the unionist campaign. And as we heard earlier, J.M. Elson, who was the editor and proprietor of the Evening Journal, was acting as the campaign manager for the liberal campaign. But sadly, and I was incredibly disappointed by this, there are no surviving copies of the Evening Journal from this period anywhere. In fact, there's only about a dozen or so copies of this paper in existence overall. Uh, there's no microfilm of the paper, only real paper copies if you're looking for them. The few copies that we have in the museum's collection here, the paper was printed on such poor quality paper that it hasn't really survived the ravages of time. The couple copies that we have of the paper almost just turn into dust as soon as you uh, you pick them up and they're very hard to handle. They just fall apart. So sadly, we don't have the opposite perspective here. What we're really only seeing is the side of the, uh, that was published in the standard, which is really what we have to work with. Uh, for the most part, it's the main source material we have locally. So let's go back and, uh, and hear what the standards editor had in response to Hetherington's letter. The editor responds to Hetherington, uh, who we also find out in the response was a public school, school inspector. And I'm not actually gonna read the whole thing because it's quite long, uh, but essentially the editor states that the paper has always been in favor of no election at all during the war, but favored the formation of a national party made up of members of both political parties. He argues that the Friends of Lovelace were so obsessed with an idea of winning an election and giving Sir Wilfrid Laurier all the encouragement and support possible that Captain Lovelace's interests and the conscription principles he held so firmly were sacrificed on every hand. And here I quote, Mr. Hetherington must now see that the situation has been completely changed while it was Mr. Chaplin's privilege to be self-sacrificing and magnanimous as he was while a candidate was being selected. It has now passed from his hands. He is now the chosen candidate of the win the war electors and the designated candidate of the union government. He could not honorably withdraw at this time from that position without the consent of those who nominated him. He goes on to say that the standard has no doubt, and we do not believe Mr. Hetherington has either, that were Captain Lovelace here and fully aware as he would be of the situation in all its bearing, he would withdraw from a candidacy which places him in a false and untenable position and he would be supporting Mr. Chaplin and all the unionist candidates to the extent of his power and influence. It is too late to swap horses. We are crossing the stream. The standard has its pledge given in good faith to keep. Those who failed to bring Captain Lovelace's name before the union government must bear the responsibility for his position today. And the only way to relieve him of that position is to withdraw him. Captain Lovelace now has before him at the front various requests from the win the war liberal friends counseling such withdrawal.
The idea of a national coalition party was very popular, as you heard, especially within conservative English Canada. And the St. Catherine Unionist campaign reflected that popularity. Similar to what we heard earlier about Captain Lovelace, many liberals, especially in English Canada, supported the idea of a coalition government and the imposition of conscription and the single-minded purpose of winning the war. And this ad that ran in the St. Catherine Standard on December 1st uh, is a great example of that. It's really hard to see that this is a unionist ad because it comes very far down at the very bottom of the, uh, the ad itself. But uh, it speaks very much to what the election issue is, which is to win the war and to uh, bring in conscription. Uh, and also takes a few moments to, uh, to take a slam at Sir Wilfrid Laurier uh, as being uh, kind of the evil evil people in this, uh, this whole campaign. As with many elections, the, as we can see kind of now, because we're in the middle of an election campaign, uh, the government of the day makes many promises that will attract a certain portion of the electorate. So, you know, just to be on the safe side, Borden's government was covering all its bases. Uh, and this article, which ran on uh, December 1st, um, but relates to um, some legislation that was brought in on November 30th, the Borden government passed an order in council to increase the separation allowance paid to wives and other dependents of soldiers below the rank of sergeant uh, who were fighting in the Canadian Expeditionary Force from $20 a month to $25 a month beginning December 1st. The official statement goes on to state and I quote, this is in accordance with the policy which has been followed by the union government and is another evidence of its desire to advance the welfare of the soldiers and their dependents in every way consistent with sound national policy. A short time ago, upon recommendation of the Minister of Finance, the government announced a substantial increase in the scale of pensions, and this action was received throughout the country with evidence of hearty approval. This is a great example of legislative power uh, to add, uh, using legislative power to advocate for a very specific political party and political aim right in the middle of an election. So of course, wives and family members who are going to be uh, the ones getting the extra $5 a month are going to think very strongly about uh, a party that is willing to do so and perhaps be concerned that should a different party come into power that this might be walked back. As in pretty much everything that was happening in Canada in the early part of basically prior to the First World War, this election was also about loyalty to the empire and to the troops. And many local ads that ran uh, in the standard, for example, reflect that reality, such as this one, which ran on December 1st, 1917, for a win the war league meeting uh, to elect the union candidate in Lincoln at their headquarters, which were located at 18 St. Paul Street. Um, and this also implied that those who lean in the other political direction, this ad implies this, although it doesn't say it, um, that those who lean in the other political direction, aka the, the liberals, were not loyal. And of course, they bring up the boys at the front. Since women were given the federal vote for the first time in this election, there were many advertisements in the local paper that specifically aimed to these new voters. And here we have an ad for the lady liberals to meet in the interests of Captain Lovelace at their rooms opposite the ns &T railway station on uh, located at 165 St. Paul Street. Plenty of advice was given out to women on how to ensure that their vote would count. While the advice is helpful, it's also quite blatantly partisan, as point six actually states, vote for the union candidate. He stands for win the war. So do you. Then vote for him. The unionist platform of win the war as the main electoral issue is clear here in this ad in their seventh point, which actually says, don't let partisans fool you. 
some will try to confuse you about the Canadian Northern Railway, the food controller, the big interests, reciprocity, the Ross rifle and other things. We have not time to settle those right now. The only thing that matters is win the war. Vote for that and you vote right. So essentially they're telling women, because this is to you women who can vote, ignore all the scandals of the past few years that the conservative government was embroiled in and think only of how to win the war, which was to vote for conscription and the union party. Of course, there were also uh, ads that ran warning of supposed false electioneering. And you can see here that uh, um, attention, women voters, attention. Uh, our attention has been called to the fact that certain ladies who know better and should confine themselves to the fact canvassing on behalf of Captain Lovelace are telling women voters that Captain Lovelace is the real win the war candidate as he is in favor of conscription. So there's a lot of confusion here, but the Win the War League, the Unionist Party, wanted to be sure that you understood that it was Mr. J.D. Chaplin. Uh, interesting is that uh, Bessie Mullock, who is a quite well-known uh, woman in a local St. Catherine circles, uh, was the, uh, um, the woman who signed her name to this, this ad. More of the same uh, false electoral officials trying to confuse voters and mislead voters regarding how to get on the voter list. This was also something that was happening. There's all kinds of, you know, this is a little bit reminiscent of some politics we've heard of in the 20th century of, you know, people being told to go to the wrong poll, people being told that they don't need to register, that their name would automatically be on the list. This happened as well in 1917. And as you can see here, more of the same warning of Laurier's tricksters passing themselves off as the only win the war candidate, uh, carrying out their nefarious campaign. Today, the wife of a soldier residing on Western Hill made up her mind to vote for the union government candidate who would vote uh, to send reinforcements to her husband. When she got to the poll, she was asked, Yes, I'm for union government, asked the soldiers, answered the soldier's wife. Then come and vote for Lovelace and get your husband home was the Judas-like plea of the agent of the enemies of union government. This is really dramatic language that they're using in here. And this is on election day, this, uh, this ad showed up in the paper. Even the patriotic fund had to step in and place an ad to remind people that it was nonpartisan and that people would not lose the monetary support they were getting from the patriotic fund if they supported one candidate over the other. We don't really hear where this is coming from, but we can only assume that one or the other uh, campaign was out there saying, if you vote for us, you'll lose your funding from the patriotic fund. Or if you vote for the other party, you'll lose your funding. All throughout the month of December uh, in 1917, the Standard ran numerous ads for meetings of both party associations uh, and, uh, and the meetings that they held in different locations. As you can see here, the Meriton Liberals Committee met in rooms in the rear of the shoe shop opposite the post office in Meriton. Um, but there were also uh, by far the Win the War League in support of Chaplin had the most funding, at least in the St. Catherine Standard. Like I said, we couldn't, we don't know what was running in the evening journal, um, but they were the ones who ran the most advertisements. And uh, here are just a bunch of examples of advertisements that ran uh, basically for the different campaigns uh, in different areas. You can see that there were ward campaigns, there were campaigns in different parts of uh, the, um, the riding overall. Uh, there were people that came and spoke in mass meetings on behalf of, um, of each of the candidates. So here you can see that uh, Gordon Waldron 
uh, from Toronto came to speak on behalf of Captain Lovelace because, of course, he wasn't here for the entirety of the campaign. But note in this ad that it says the real win the war candidate. It was very confusing. Uh, and uh, voters really had to keep their eye on uh, what the real issue was that, and who they were voting for throughout the campaign. Here's a couple more ads. This one actually ran, uh, I don't know if you recall, most people, if you get the standard, you recall there's a little section at the bottom of the front page on the very bottom below the fold uh, that has advertising space. This is one for the Chaplin government. Uh, the eyes of our hero at the front, the heroes at the front are upon you. Make sure you vote for Chaplin and the union government. And then this one here, which is really interesting, how to mark your, va your ballot. There's a whole pile of instruction on what to do on election day and put your X next to James Do Chaplin's name while you're at it. While the fight was local, the St. Catherine Standard ran political ads that touched on the perceived concerns of voters all across the country. The unionist campaign was not uh, above using fear to get their message across, such as this political cartoon uh, that ran in the paper on December 3rd, uh, 1917. The message that a vote for the liberals was a vote for the Kaiser or the enemy. It was very popular message. Uh, and several ads of a similar nature ran throughout the campaign, uh, such as this one that ran for, again, for J.D. Chaplin, uh, Shall Germany haul down this flag? Uh, very dramatic that if you don't vote for the Unionist campaign, Germany was going to take over. Um, Laurier, a Laurier victory would be celebrated in Germany. Also, a Laurier victory would be the first Canadian defeat. Men and women of Canada, this is not an election, it's a battle with the Hun. Well, sure it's an election, but support the union government so that Germany doesn't defeat the Canadians. It rests with you, you have the vote for the boys or the Kaiser, take your pick. Do you wanna vote for our boys overseas or do you wanna vote for the Kaiser? Another popular theme in political advertisement was to play on the French-English divide in the country by vilifying those in Quebec who had anti-conscriptionist views and would take the country in a different direction should they and Laurier's liberals win the war or the, the election. A popular figure in these cartoons was uh, Henri Bourassa, who is pictured here, who was uh, often the Quebec boogeyman in these ads, such as this one. This is him sitting in the chair. Parlez-vous Francais, he says. Um, and he represented the idea that Quebec was just waiting to take the wealth uh, of English Canada. You can see he's got his feet up on the, uh, the safe that's holding all the, the victory loan money. Uh, that he, and that the French in Quebec were going to take the wealth that English Canada had built up and funnel it to their own ends, including the victory loan funds. Uh, Wilfrid Laurier continued to be a popular leader and was less often used as the scary monster who was going to derail the country's uh, prosecution of the war. Uh, instead, Barassa and Quebec were the whipping boys representing anti-war and anti-conscriptionist thought. Henri Bourassa, in actual fact, saw all the maneuvering as an attempt to ram conscription through as the thin edge of the wedge of an illegitimate autocratic and military regime that was splitting the country, threatening social strife, and violating the principle of military autonomy that was adopted at the time of Confederation. And he was not shy about speaking out against injustice as he saw it. Uh, but as you can see, this theme was a popular one with uh, anti-liberal advertising throughout the campaign. Uh, as you can see here, these all ran in the standard in the weeks following up to the election. And you can see at the bottom, they were run by the Citizens Union Committee. They must have had a fairly large uh, wallet to be able to spend on advertising, but because by far they took up more space than anything else uh, in the newspaper when it came to the election. So Quebec must not rule Canada. Um, your duty to Canada and the British Empire. 
is to ascertain the name of the endorsed union government candidate candidate and vote for him. A solid Quebec will vote to rule all Canada. Only a solid Ontario can defeat them. Also a solid Quebec will vote to rule all Canada. Only a solid Ontario can defeat them. Like this political cartoon shows with solid Quebec standing, Barissa standing on top of a concrete block. Uh, um, and what would happen if uh, if the liberals were to win this uh, this election campaign? Political cartoon has always been very influential in uh, election campaigns throughout all of Canada's history. And uh, uh, if you're really interested, I encourage you to uh, to look further into political cartoon over the years. It's it's a very interesting topic. In 1917, religion played a much larger role in the political life of a community. The influence of the church on voters could be significant, and all major political parties sought the support of the church in their cause. This wasn't any different in St. Catharines, where ministers spoke from the pul pulpit in support of their cause. And the paper even uh, put articles in the paper basically saying what was being said in the, uh, the church. In this slide, Reverend R.D. Hamilton of Welland Avenue Church riffed on the Quebec theme as a villain, or ripped on the Quebec as a villain theme, as he expressed thanks that Quebec, in their statement that they have done enough, does not voice the opinion of the people of Canada, who are in the fight to, to stay. Sorry, I had a a typo here, I couldn't figure out what my typo said. We're in the fight to stay and who will see that reinforcements, the call for which is on the lips of every dying hero are sent to the aid of those who have gone from this dominion to fill the gaps left by the brave boys who have fallen. Along this line, the speaker also made an appeal that the people stand by the boys when they vote to cast their vote for a union government which will sucker the boys at the front on the lips of the dying soldiers. We have to vote unionist according to this, this uh, Reverend Hamilton. Should you think that this was an isolated instance? This article speaks to the sermon given by Reverend F.W. Stewart of the Baptist Church who spoke on the hypocrites in the church. The hypocrite, he says, is an actor, one assuming a better part of virtue or religion for the sake of name advantage to be gained. He goes on to say the hypocrite was then compared with those who gladly make use of Canadian citizenship with all of its advantages to cover enemy sympathy and support. Mr. Stewart said this morning when asked by a representative of the standard that he would very gladly make further application to the comparison to those who at this momentous crisis in the life of Canada failed to give to the utmost support to the program to put the whole life and strength of our country into one common united effort to bring victory to our cause. Those who hesitate to back the last man and the, to the last dollar are men in the trenches are playing false to the country in which they claim citizenship. Even on the eve of election day, the St. Paul Street Methodist minister, Reverend Sanford E. Marshall, asked his congregation to be wisely guided in depositing their ballots today. The issue at stake is too great to be allowed to go without serious thought and party feeling should be forgotten and lost when the issue of country is in such a serious condition. When so many of the sons of our empire are fighting and giving their life's blood, reinforcement should be sent at once. Waiting for a referendum might be very serious for it is evident that in the near future, a decisive battle will be fought on the Western Front, and without men to take the places of those wounded, Canada will be put in a class with Russia. So, of course, as we know, it was great news that the uh, that um, soldiers were going to be casting their votes 
and the newspaper ran a story about the ballot boxes being taken to the front. That's what this story is. This is just a little part of it. I didn't put the entire uh, story here because the interesting thing to me is the headline, which is quite inflammatory because they're saying it's the votes of the wounded and dying that you're supporting if you vote for the unionist campaign, essentially. You can see from this picture, not all the soldiers at the time of the election were wounded and dying, uh, which is so it's not 100% correct to make that be the headline, but it's definitely very heart wrenching and it's supposed to really make you think about making sure you support those soldiers at the front. Of course, not to be left out of this whole campaign in the paper were those at the front who were given their say in the publication of their letters to the editor, published in the paper throughout the campaign. As you can see here as an example was from Sergeant Richard Kearney who writes, vote for conscription, exclamation mark. If you only knew how things were here, you would. Similarly, this letter, of which I have sewn just an excerpt, it was quite a bit longer, uh, is by Private Fred Sexton, who says, I'm glad to hear that conscription is a sure thing in Canada at last. There is plenty of need for it. This is just a small example. There were actually quite a few more letters that were uh, uh, were run in the paper at this time from uh, soldiers, or my. but if I had ran them all, my lecture would be really long and I'm sure we would lose quite a bit of the audience part way through. <laughs> so election day arrived on December 17th, 1917, and the newspaper ran extra editions on that day uh, to keep the electorate up to date on the race. Uh, they also kept a running tally on the bulletin board at the standard office of the election returns. This election saw enormous community support, especially from women organizers who unsurprisingly jumped in with great enthusiasm in support of the franchise on both sides of the debate. As quoted here, to the ladies, great credit should be given. They have entered a new field with great energy and are showing the men how to accomplish results. Not alone are they acting as scrutineers, but they are going out after votes and they do not return unsuccessful. Across the country, here's an, uh, a bit of a graphic that shows how the vote turned out across the country. Uh, Borden's unionist swept the English speaking regions, uh, returning to parliament with a majority of 153 seats, including only three from Quebec, uh, Laurier's Liberals, on the other hand, won 82 seats, uh, 62 of which uh, were from Quebec. So you can see here that the Liberals really only took Quebec uh, and, uh, and PEI, um, actually tied in PEI uh, in that election, essentially across the country, uh, the Unionist uh, campaign pretty much swept the, uh, the vote. In the end, unsurprisingly, soldiers voted massively for the union government uh, with a vote of 215,849,000 for the unionist campaign versus 18,522 for the, uh, the Liberal Party. So did the increase in the soldier vote make a difference? Yes. The civilian population vote results were 841,944 to 744,849. And the soldier vote added more than 200,000 votes. So the gerrymandering really did make a difference because the civilian population results were only 100,000 difference uh, between the two. In Lincoln County, J.D. Chaplin received 5,930 votes and E.J. Lovelace 2,126 votes. It was clear from the start that J.D. Chaplin was the front runner and the final vote bore that out. 
course, the victory was celebrated by the Union campaign with a torchlight parade and victory speeches all around. The 19th Regiment Band was called out to play for the crowd, and those with automobiles were asked to join the night parade. Strangely, there was some disappointment due to the logistical confusion when large crowds had gathered near to J.D. Chaplin's house on Ontario Street, uh, but they missed out on the fact that the speeches had been moved to the Standard Office instead. So there was just a small kerfuffle about the logistics of the parade. But in the end, speeches were held, a parade was held, and they spoke out at the Standard Office. And Burgoyne, who was the editor of the Standard at the time, actually spoke out on behalf of, uh, of J.D. Chaplin at the, uh, uh, at the large gathering. So... Before we move on from here, what of conscription and its lasting impacts? Did it make a difference at all to the war effort in contrast to the lasting impacts that it created for Canada? Of the 401,000 men who were called up for service through conscription, 99,651 were on strength with the Canadian Expeditionary Force on November 11th, 1918, when the war ended. Of those, only 47,500 had proceeded overseas and only 24,132 had actually been taken up on strength in units in France uh, and were shoring up the ragged Canadian infantry battalions by the last months of the war. So really only a small amount of the conscripted soldiers, a quarter basically made it overseas to the war by the time war ended. But we really need to remember here that in 1916 and 1917, when conscription was the, the real uh, debated issue at the time, that almost all the generals and politicians expected that the war would continue far into 1919, and that the need for conscripts would have been much greater uh, had the war done so. And so to conclude, I will quote historians Dutille and Mackenzie, kind of as a bookend to this presentation. And I quote, there was still a war to be fought and Canada's war effort remained the Borden government's main concern. Laurier may not have gotten his plebiscite, but the election vote was seen as the closest thing possible to a national referendum on conscription. And the verdict of the Canadian people was clear. The Union success was a victory for conscription and the war effort. Canada's war effort would not be allowed to falter. They go on to conclude that the election of 1917 was fought on the issue of conscription, but it was decided on the basis of identity. Never has an election so divided the country. Never before or after did the country come so close to the brink of destruction. Politics was different after this election. And if a more mature country did not emerge, the nation that the war and the 1917 election did produce was at least less naive about politics and the lengths to which people will go when they feel their nation is threatened. The repercussions of the 1917 election continue to haunt our, our politics today and have shaped the political landscape for the past 100 plus years. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed uh, this short, shortish <laughs> look at the 1917 uh, political campaign for the federal election. Thanks very much, Kathleen. Um, uh, while we have some questions, I think I'm in the wrong place in my slides. To the right place. Oh, no, I was in the right place. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Kathleen. Uh, while we wait for a few more questions, there's a couple of comments and I've got some comments too, I'm sure. If anybody has any comments or questions, feel free, go ahead and pop them in the chat box. Uh, that was super interesting. 
uh, especially for a political junkie like me. Uh, if you enjoyed tonight's presentation though, of course, please consider making a donation uh, to the museum so that we can continue to provide the high quality programming you expect from us. We really appreciate any donation you're able to make. Please give us a call at 905-984-8880 uh, to make a donation or visit the donation portal on our active STC page to make a donation. The link for the portal was included in the VMLS email today. So it's super easy, you just click. You might have to search museum, click on virtual museum lecture series. There's options there for you to donate. If you wanna donate more than that, you can call us, or I think you can even offer more in when you click as well. So super easy. Uh, anyway, your donation makes a difference. It really does, thank you very much. Uh, we'd like to remind everyone uh, also, as usual, to please like, follow, and subscribe on all of our social media channels. If you're watching right now and you're not subscribed to our YouTube channel, please just slide your cursor over and click subscribe. Uh, that would be super great. Um, thank you very much. And you'll get, you'll get notifications about when we post videos and, and things like that. And when we go live, we're, we're, we're basically everywhere. So if you if you're on a if you're on a platform, uh, follow us. That'd be great. Once again, we're uh, excited, uh, waiting with bated breath, of course, because I have I will only tell you what the lineup is on May twenty fourth. But uh, once again, we're very excited to announce the autumn lecture series. Uh, and just a friendly reminder to mark your calendars. Of course, if you don't watch live, you can always catch up. Uh, on uh, our YouTube playlist and, uh, and on the YouTube channel, but that requires you to subscribe. I'm just kidding. Go ahead and subscribe so you don't miss anything. Uh, next time on the Virtual Museum Lecture Series, we are excited to welcome special guest historian and president of the Ontario Black History Society, Natasha Henry, back to the lecture series to give a talk about Emancipation Day be an excellent way to close out our winter slash spring slash summer uh, lecture series uh, ahead of uh, a really busy summer. The Virtual Museum Lecture Series is produced by the St. Catharines Museum and Well Canal Center and the City of St. Catharines. Now, Kathy, we have a couple of comments in the, uh, in the, in the, in the chat. Brian says, very interesting. Thanks, Kathleen. So that's very nice. Thanks, Brian. Brian. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching, everybody. <laughs> uh, and then also another comment says, it's sad to see how in so many ways our current days don't differ all that much <laughs> from those days politically. Um, and I wonder if you had a reaction yourself. Oh, so our reaction is based on seeing all of that content in 60 Minutes. What was your reaction over a slow burn? Because you've been researching for months and months and months, sitting at the microfilm. Um, did was there a point where you said was it right away, or did it take time for you to sort of say, "Oh gosh," <laughs> especially because you were researching during the last federal election? Yeah, I, I thought it would. It didn't take me too long to see that the Liberal Party's. Uh, representation in the standard was not very high. Uh, but then I especially made that connection. When I made the connection between uh, Burgoyne and the unionist uh, campaign, and then Elson and the liberal campaign, it was clear that that connection was there. And then I, I scoured the world, I guess, well, maybe not the world, but as much of the world as I could get to uh, from my perspective of uh, to find a, a, even one copy of the mm -hmm. evening journal from this period. And uh, I appreciate Brian's comment because I did ask him as well <laughs> whether he had ever seen a copy uh, of this paper from that period uh, just to see what was there on the other side. Uh, I personally wasn't surprised about the partisanship of Canadian uh, newspapers in the period because Canadian newspapers have been incredibly partisan basically since prior Forever. to Confederation. Uh, so that didn't surprise me in any way at all. Right. Yeah. Uh, but I was very disappointed that I couldn't really give you both sides of the, the view because we only had the one paper. Uh, it would be almost like if all of a sudden all news 
uh, disappeared except for false Fox News and then today and then you, that would be the only thing that you would see. Uh, so um, it was kind of an interesting parallel to what we see today. A lot of people think that newspapers are and new, the news media are nonpartisan and that they're supposed to be nonpartisan, but that has never been the case in Canadian history. Uh, our media has always been partisan in some way or other, and they're sometimes political um, candidates or people who were in political power owned the paper. And so uh, it's, it's, it's not a surprise to me. I, and I find it super interesting about, uh, about how they, they go about getting that message out in a sneaky sort of way to make themselves look like they're not being partisan, but they really are. <laughs> Absolutely. I thought it was, uh, it was really interesting that they published the, um, I guess you could find this information online by returning by, by poll, I guess, by returning center, um, but that they published by municipality. We don't, you, I, don't, I don't remember seeing that, normal, that kind of chart normally, but published by municipality, the, uh, the, um, the, the, the numbers, the, the votes. And it made me think just briefly, I wonder if we compared the election results to the subscriptions of both papers, if they would be somewhat similar, because how many people would be reading two papers a day or regularly enough to keep up with that kind of debate? So if you're a standard voter and that's the only news source that you have, similar to you know, some folks who only watch one particular type of news, uh, you, you know, you mentioned Fox News or on the other side, CNN or whatever, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, how many people would be thinking about the opposite perspective um, so there's, there's the role of the media certainly hasn't changed. The partisanship might have a different flavor, uh, especially maybe before the most recent, like between then and now <laughs> didn't seem to be so, uh, like, um, the world will end if you vote a certain way, uh, until the most recent election. And I think that's perhaps why, uh, folks watching might have identified some parallels really easily because there were similar messages from various uh, campaigns and media outlets in the last few elections, it, both American, Canadian, British, whatever, that if you vote a certain way, the world will end. Um, the so interesting thing about that is that, you know, that that you're talking about how they they gave the election results by municipality. I actually cut off a part of that that bit that was there and it actually gave the election results by polling station oh, okay and some of the polling stations were literally people's houses yeah. so like you were coming like if you were in this section of the city you came in the side door at like john's house and if you came in like if you were this part of the city these streets you came into the front door at this guy's house and that was where your polling station was and so like the, it even got down to the micro of like 50 votes went to this thing in this riding and you could almost pick out who had voted <laughs> for who based on that uh that how close the detail was uh because the vote was under ten thousand votes in in lincoln essentially mm -hmm. uh overall it's a, it's a fairly small electorate i think we do forget about that that part of things as well but uh one thing i don't think i mentioned in my even back then it was yeah. small, much smaller like we're talking much smaller electorate than today, even with right? the added voters even with um, added or yeah. <laughs> added vote, uh, vote I don't know where to put my air quotes but added voters yeah <laughs> uh, but I didn't mention it in my um uh, my talk and I should have actually but this election in 1917 is the election that saw the highest percentage of voters in Canadian history I was actually going to ask yeah. if that this was the this is the big turnout election yeah, yeah. I think it was like 87 percent of the election wow in that election it was 87 percent quite quite high hi yeah wow so i guess that was going to be that was going to be my next question and to follow up with that was sometimes we hear elections as a status quo, uh, labeled as a status quo election or a change election um we don't often hear about a crisis election uh would you you would uh, identify that this election as a crisis election is that is that right? Yeah, for sure. And I mean, just the fact that some of the advertisements said, forget about all the things that happened before. The only yes. thing that counts is conscription and winning the war. So, and that, so yeah. 
So <laughs> having just lived through a crisis election, uh, because yeah. that was the message. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Okay, great. That's it's really... very similar. And in fact, <laughs> even some of the, the Laurier liberals that joined the union party said at the time that they only vote, they only joined the party for the wartime. So in theory, the 1917 election was for the government that would be in power for the next however many years, right? It could have been, you know, the elect, the war could have only gone on for six more months, say, for example, yes. but yeah. it went on for another year. But uh, the, the party went on for longer, essentially, the government yeah. went on for longer. And so those people who were the liberals who joined the unionists were really like, you know what, once the war is over, we don't really want to join the conservative agenda for, uh, for the election. And so they did eventually have an election, probably sooner than they wanted to. Borden eventually uh, resigns. Wilfrid Laurier dies in 1919. So, you know, the whole political landscape changes after the war. Yes. And yeah. those people who were only there because of that one issue, because they supported conscription, which is basically what Lovelace was all about. He was mm -hmm. really only supporting conscription on the unionist side. Uh, but as a liberal, he couldn't he couldn't really say that like he wanted to be the conscription side, but only for that issue. And so those people all decided to kind of distance themselves after that. They weren't going to support Borden's agenda after that. And that I think point number seven in that list of how to vote <laughs> was uh, <laughs> so so ironic, I guess, because the uh, it's like ignore all the partisan fools yeah. <laughs> who, who tell you that <laughs> Yeah. What like, hey, that's partisan as I'm being partisan. Isn't that funny? I love that uh, they even enumerated all the scandals that they had had. Yeah, just ignore okay. all these things. These things in particular, all these scandals, ignore those. We're just going to There's go something about, the, yeah, there's something about that kind of bold faced <laughs> honesty that I prefer <laughs> to sort of the more sneaky types of uh, advertising and you know, that kind of thing uh, that sometimes we're used to hearing the the more tricky. I'm not sure where this person stands. Anyway, uh, Brian also has another comment about uh, uh, an idea anyway, about um, where to find stuff from the evening journal. He says, I wonder if other papers carried stories from the journal, maybe the globe or the spectator uh, to see the other side of the story. Um, yeah, they may have. That's true. It's an idea, but yeah. <laughs> you already spend hours and hours and hours and hours going through the standard. Um, that sounds like a project for another time. It's possible. <laughs> I mean, some of those newspapers, thankfully, are searchable online. Like I know that oh, yes. uh, the standard is not searchable that way, but uh, some newspapers actually are searchable by keyword. And if I could potentially give that a try. Uh, that's a good point, Brian. I'll have to give good. it a try because I'm actually kind of interested now because this the, this whole missing of an entire side of of news media in St. Catharines for that entire period is really unfortunate. Uh, we I think most people just think the standard was the only thing because there there is no copies. There are only a dozen copies or so of the or evening journal from like they were around for years. Yeah. Their readers were less nostalgic, I guess, about hanging on to copies than the they fell apart. The copies yeah, that we are. have of the paper, when you go to handle them, they literally just. Yeah, cheaper print. <laughs> Anywho, uh, that's <laughs> great idea, Brian. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, everyone. Uh, and thank you, Kathy, for your wonderful lecture. Very, uh, Thanks, very interesting. Um, I, th I think it's given everyone on the lecture and who watches in the future a lot to think about, a lot to remember uh, as we head to the polls here in Ontario, but also uh, uh, locally, the municipal election is coming up. Uh, and also just generally as like, you know, in the media today, there's a lot of discussion about where information comes from and how information is disseminated and, and what's partisan and what's not. So lots to think about, lots to remember. Um, thanks very much. And thanks everyone for watching. We'll see you in two weeks for our last lecture of the winter slash spring slash summer with Natasha Henry. Uh, thanks everybody and have a good night. You can turn your camera and audio off.